Okay, good morning, Valley Church. Um, I have a few volunteers that I need. I, I grabbed them before service. Darren, DJ, Cliff, yeah, here you go. Okay, we're going to do an exercise this morning as part of my message together. So they're going to hand all of you a blank piece of paper, and all I want you to do is to hold on to that piece of paper. Don't lose it. I was going to give it to you when you walked in the sanctuary doors, but I thought, you know what? We're going to lose it. We're going to set it somewhere during worship, so we'll just do it right at the beginning of the message this morning. Well, we are continuing our series God of the Valley, reminding ourselves that God is not just the God of the hills, the mountaintops in our life, but he is also the God of the valleys as well. So as you get this blank piece of paper this morning, I want you to be thinking throughout my message about naming your valley. What I want you to do with that blank piece of paper throughout the message is ask God to help you name your valley. And maybe some of you are not going through a valley right now in life, and so you're on the mountaintop. That's great. But I want you to think back to the last valley that you came out of. We're going to name our valleys together. And when you realize what the name of your valley is, it should just be one word. Write it down on that piece of paper and just hold on to it till the end of the message. We're going to do something all together at the end. And you may be thinking, well, I don't know what the name of my valley is. Let me give you a few examples. Maybe you are in the valley of cancer. You're in the valley of divorce, discouragement, addiction, grief, loneliness, you're walking through the valley of shame, the valley of raising a rebellious child, the valley of doubt, depression, fear, anxiety, infertility, singleness, confusion, anger, rejection. I don't know what your valley is. I wish I could sit down with all of you one-on-one, -on -one, have some coffee, and talk about the valleys in life. Unfortunately, I can't. But God can help you name your valley this morning. And that's what I want you to do. So when you realize, even if it's in the middle of my message, I know what the name of my valley is. Write it down on that piece of paper and hang on to it. I'm going to pray once more before we go any further. Would you pray with me? Father God, would you help us to pause right now? And lay aside any distracting thoughts. Just live in the moment with you, God. And God, would you help us to pray as Samuel did? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the spring of 2005... I felt like I was on the mountaintop in life, like I could conquer the world. I felt strong, independent. I had just graduated from high school. I was pursuing college, like, bring it, I can take it, right? On the mountaintop. And then not much longer, a few months later, the spring of 2006 hit. And it hit hard. Both of my grandpas died suddenly within a month of each other. And all of a sudden, I felt like death was surrounding me. I felt alone, overwhelmed with grief, and confused altogether. I felt like I was living in a valley of death. Have you ever experienced those times in life when you're on the mountaintop, everything is going great, you're feeling pretty good about yourself, and then it's like a tsunami wave hits you out of nowhere, and you find yourself alone in a deep, dark valley, and you don't know how to get out. 
We're going to be looking at another valley in the Bible today. It's actually mentioned several times, but not many people speak or preach on this valley. And this valley is called the Valley of Kidron. The word Kidron means black or gloomy brook. The Valley of Kidron was a foul and filthy ditch outside the walls of Jerusalem, and some have even called it the open town sewer. There are reasons for believing that at least the filth of the temple ran into this Kidron Valley. The scouring of the sacrificial places went by an underchannel into this brook, so the passing, therefore, over that foul and black brook became the symbol of a time of deep sorrow and acute distress. This valley of Kidron was known by grief and shame. And another name for the valley of Kidron is the valley of suffering. There's some pictures of this valley that I have for you to look at. It is situated directly west of the temple in Jerusalem. And because the temple is the highest point in Jerusalem, it overlooks the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was betrayed. The Garden of Gethsemane is on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. So the Kidron Valley is the valley that runs between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. And actually today, this valley is now a cemetery that is called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And we're going to take a deeper look this morning at the significance behind the Kidron Valley that you read about in Scripture. Now, three times in the Old Testament during the divided kingdom, the temple was cleansed. And this was done to remove altars and idols to other gods that Israel's had put into place when they were backsliding in their sin. They actually brought these altars and idols inside the temple where they were supposed to worship God, but they worshiped false gods. And so all of these idols were either burned, ground to the dust, or thrown you probably will guess, into the Kidron Valley. So I'm going to share a few of those with you. In 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 12, this is the first king. His name was King Asa, who destroyed the idols and burned them in Kidron. It said, he put away the male cult prostitutes out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. He also removed Maka, his mother, from being queen mother because she had made an abominable image for Asherah, and Asa cut down her image and burned it at the brook Kidron. So there's the first time the temple is cleansed and it's thrown into this valley of Kidron. But then about 200 years later, another king, King Hezekiah, we find him cleansing the temple again in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 16. It says, The priests went into the other part into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. And they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it and carried it out to the brook Kidron. And then one more time, it was cleansed again about a hundred years later by King Josiah. And we read about this in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 6. It says, And he brought out the Asherah from the house of the Lord outside Jerusalem to the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron and beat it to dust and cast the dust of it upon the graves of the common people. So three times we read about the temple being cleansed and them taking these idols and these images to the Kidron Valley and destroying them. But even before the temple was cleansed those three times, the very first mention of the Kidron Valley is found in 2 Samuel chapter 15. And that's where I want you to turn with me this morning. If you have your Bibles or your phone or your tablet, Turn with me to 2 Samuel 
chapter 15, and I'll give you a little context for what's going on here. If you get some time this week, I encourage you to read the chapters before and after this because we're going to be jumping a little bit to save some time. But what's going on is that um, we are going to read this passage and then we're actually going to parallel it with one in the New Testament in John 18. So we'll be here in 2 Samuel 15 and then we're going to jump to John 18. But 2 Samuel 15, King David is currently king. You remember King David? Jonathan preached about him a couple weeks ago. I Actually, I think we'll all remember that message because Cliff almost died, right? Um, he struck down Goliath with the sling and the stone. Um, but now King David is older. He has children, and this passage is about his son, his very own son, Absalom, who has conspired against his own father and decided to take the kingdom of Israel for himself. So literally, Absalom is overthrowing his father and making himself king. Pick it up with me in verse 13. We read, And a messenger came to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servant said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. So the king went out and all his household after him. Now jump ahead with me to verse 23. It says, And all the land wept aloud as all the people passed by, and the king crossed the brook Kidron, and all the people passed on toward the wilderness. And jump once more with me to verses 30 to 31. It says, But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping, as he went barefoot and with his head covered, and all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up weeping as they went. And it was told David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. So I told you we jumped around a little bit, so take some time on your own this week to read it in full. But I want to point out to you a few things in these verses. First, we said David's own son, Absalom, but also his faithful counselor for years, a man named Ahithophel, both conspire against and betray David. In reality, they want David dead. So David, his family, and his servants literally have to run for their lives. And notice the first place they had to cross when they were escaping. The Kidron Valley. The valley known as suffering and one that symbolized deep sorrow and distress. Symbolically, This was a picture of a temporary end or death to David's reign. Notice the suffering, the grief, the turmoil, the sadness, probably anxiety and fear that David and all these people with him were living in when they crossed the valley of Kidron. Through these verses, we're going to see that David was another type of Christ. Now, I said we were going to jump one more time, so I want you to turn with me to John 18 and the New Testament. We're going to parallel these two passages and find some similarities here. We're going to find two men who were both kings, and they both had to walk through this valley. Do you know who else walked through the valley of Kidron? Jesus did. The night before his crucifixion. Read about it with me in John 18. It 
says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kedron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? I don't think that it was a coincidence that both David and Jesus had to cross the Kidron Valley at very specific times in their life. After crossing this valley, both men went to the Mount of Olives. And you may wonder, what was the Mount of Olives? Well, this was an olive tree grove on the other side of the valley where olives were pressed and made into oil. It was olive oil that was used in ancient Israel to anoint prophets, priests, and kings. So this was the oil that would have been used to anoint David as king. And when you find Jesus in deep prayer the night before his crucifixion, you can read about it in Luke twenty two forty four. You find Jesus sweating drops of blood in this olive garden. And it says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. This could have been a picture of, of Jesus being anointed in this olive grove where the Garden of Gethsemane was because it is fitting that Jesus, who is our prophet, our priest, and our king, was in an olive grove when he began his fulfillment of his role as Messiah, the anointed one. Now, it is very significant that Jesus had to walk through the Valley of Kidron to get to the garden where he would be betrayed by Judas. To help further understand why this valley is so unique, I want to remind you of some specific events that would have been taking place. You know, you may be thinking, Why are we spending so much time looking at the Valley of Kidron? Why is it so significant? Like, usually people just gloss over these places in Scripture. Like, how many of you are guilty of when you get to, like, chapters of names in the Bible? You just kind of, like, skim them or just jump over them all together? Okay, thank you. Me too. I've been guilty of it. And the same is true of places. But what I have come to learn is that when you take the time to dig deeper into those places or those names of people, is that you discover that in the ordinary is where you find the extraordinary. And the same is true for this Valley of Kidron. You see, the afternoon before the Passover, which would have been Thursday, Hang in with me there. The priests who would have been sacrificing lambs on the altar in the temple as a way to cover the sins of God's people because God had given specific instructions to Moses back in Leviticus about the sacrificing of lambs. If we read in Leviticus 17.11, God said, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your 
your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. You see, back in ancient Israel, in Old Testament times, sacrificing a lamb was what covered the sins of the people. And it had to be a blood sacrifice because life is found in the blood. You have to have blood before you can have life. Pastor John MacArthur writes in Experiencing the Passion that historical records of Jesus' time indicate that as many as a quarter million lambs were slain in one typical Passover season, requiring hundreds of priests to carry out the task. A quarter million lambs, 250,000 lambs would have been slain. At this specific time, Passover, every year. Now, there would have been a massive amount of blood and water from the ritual cleansing that would have been drained. So imagine all the blood and water that would be drained from these 250,000 lambs in the temple. Where would all that blood and water have flowed? It was likely drained into the Kidron Valley because it was positioned right outside the Temple Mount walls. Do you remember what came from Jesus after he breathed his last breath on the cross? In John 19, 34, it says, One of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, this time of year, people probably avoided going near the Kidron Valley around the Passover because of all these sacrifices that were being made. It literally would have been viewed as a valley of suffering and death. And this practice was done year after year in the Old Testament as a way to cover the sins of the Israelites as they waited for their Messiah and their Savior from sin. We read the very well-known verse in Hebrews 9.22, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Just as the lamb in the Old Testament had to be sacrificed to bring about forgiveness, So Jesus, and here's the connection we make, Jesus, who is also called the Lamb of God, was sacrificed and died in your place. He shed his blood for you on the cross to bring about the forgiveness for your sin that leads to eternal life. Life is found in the blood. Are you seeing the symbolism and the reason for why Jesus would have walked through the Kidron Valley? Scripture says of Jesus twice that he is the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Two times John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God in John 1 verses 29 and 36. It said the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then a few verses later in verse 36, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. Jesus knew, walking through that valley, what was about to take place. First, that he would be betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, then put on trial, mocked and beaten, and finally crucified. And all of this, Jesus did willingly for you. You and I deserve to be the ones on that cross to pay the punishment that our sin deserved, but God knew that we couldn't save ourselves. We weren't perfect, 
but he had a perfect son, Jesus, who was willing to come down and die on the cross in your place, rise again from the dead to be victorious over sin and death once and for all. And he offers you the gift of forgiveness and salvation through his blood that he gave for you. Jesus brought eternal life to this dark and gloomy Kedron Valley. So now that we've read this passage in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel about King David, and now King Jesus in John 18, I want to point out some of the parallels between David and Jesus that shows us David was a type of Christ, a foreshadow of a greater king who is to come. We find that both David and Jesus were conspired against and betrayed by someone closest to them. David wrote of his counselor and his friend Ahithophel in Psalm 41 verse 9, He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. And then Jesus quoted that exact same verse in John 13, 18, just hours before his betrayal by Judas. What you will also find in both of these accounts is that Ahithophel and Judas both end up going away and hanging themselves for what they did. We also find that both David and Jesus were rejected by their family and friends. As Jesus passed over Kedron on that gloomy night, he had his friends. But what was their friendship worth? They were true in heart, but they were weak and feeble. And when the conflict came, they all forsook him and fled. Both David and Jesus passed through the Kedron Valley. Both David and Jesus wept over Jerusalem. David when he was on the Mount of Olives and Jesus when he was riding down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem for his triumphal entry found in Luke 19:41 it says that Jesus wept over the city. And both David and Jesus submitted themselves to what God was doing in their life. If you read further in the account in 2 Samuel, as David is fleeing, you'll read about a man named Shimei that kind of comes out of nowhere and he starts cursing David and throwing stones at him. And one of David's servants asks, hey, can I go and kill that guy? And David says, no. Let him do what he is doing because God is allowing it to happen. You find Jesus submitting to God's will when he was praying in the garden and sweating drops of blood. Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. And as we look at the lives of David and Jesus when they went through their valleys of suffering, we find four practices that we can learn from them for when we go through our own valleys of suffering. If you got a handout this morning, this is where you can grab your paper and and write these four practices down. I want to give you something practical to take with you because whether we're a follower of Jesus or not, we all go through valleys of suffering in our life. So when you're in that valley of suffering, These are practices that you can do. The first one that I find David and Jesus doing is pray. Pray to your heavenly Father when you're in the valley of suffering. Too often, and I'm guilty of this as well, I find myself praying like before meals or before bedtime with my kids. But how often do we specifically set aside time in our day to be devoted to prayer. Sometimes when you're in the valley of suffering, if we're just honest, we feel like that's the last thing I feel like doing is praying because God's allowing me to go through this. But can I encourage you, pray to your heavenly Father. 
He knows where you are, and he knows what he's doing. The second thing I find David and Jesus doing, and I actually kind of love this, is weep. Weep over the reality and the gravity of sin, the forcefulness of sin. You know, we wouldn't go through valleys in our life if it weren't for the curse of sin, the reality, the forcefulness, the gravity of it. So weep over it. You find two men who were both kings weeping. They allowed themselves to feel their emotions. And you know, I, I specifically want to encourage my brothers here today. I think sometimes as men, you feel like, I got to hold it all together. I got to be the strong one. I'm not going to show weakness through crying. You know, it's actually in your weakness and in your weeping where God can do his greatest work. So my sisters and also my brothers, allow yourself to weep when you're in the valley of suffering. David did. Jesus did. Weeping in the valley can lead you into the will of God for your life. And weeping can also be a sign of submission to God's will. So first, pray. Second, weep. The third one I find David and Jesus doing is submit to God's will. We, you can be honest about this. Sometimes we don't always like God's will for our life, okay? Do you think that Jesus really liked the fact that he was going to have to go and die on the cross for the sins of the whole world? He did it for the joy that was set before him, but we, we can feel the agony and the grief that he lived through knowing what was about to happen. But he still submitted himself to the will of his Father. Can I encourage you, when you're in the valley of suffering, pray the same prayer that Jesus did. Not my will, but yours be done. Submit to God's will. And lastly, the fourth practice, I see D David and Jesus worship God for who he is. And we know we don't always feel like worshiping in the valley. What is worship? It's the feeling or expressions of, expression of reverence or adoration for God. You know, when David looked back over his valley, he let it lead him to worship. He wrote at least two, if not three, of the Psalms at this specific time in his life when he was running from his own son. He wrote Psalm 3, Psalm 41, and even the most well-known psalm, in the Bible, Psalm 23, some scholars even believe that David wrote, could have written Psalm 23 during this time in his life. You know, David and Jesus understood that sadness is okay. It's okay to be sad when you're in the valley of suffering. But David knew something that his son Absalom did not, that you can't stuff things down in your life. You take them to God. You name your valley. That's what David did. David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. David knew that he wasn't alone in his valley. Now, there's one difference between David and Jesus. After David crossed the Kidron Valley and he paused at the Garden of Gethsemane to weep, he then continued on to safety. And eventually, if you keep reading, God brought David back to Jerusalem as king. However, this is the difference between the two. Jesus did not 
go on to safety. He could have kept going just as David had. He could have used that same ancient escape route, but instead Jesus paused, he prayed, and he accepted the cup of suffering from his father. Jesus waited for his arrest in the garden that he could be brought back to Jerusalem and face the utter depths of death's darkest valley. And we talk often here at Valley Church about how we want to see Jesus bring hope and healing to our valley and our world. He brought us the hope of eternal life through his death and resurrection. And I want to remind you of that hope from these verses in Titus 3, starting at verse 4. It says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That is our hope. Jesus Christ is our hope that bought us eternal life. Now, we've been talking this morning about how the Kidron Valley is a place that is related to mourning, sorrow, and death, and currently it's a cemetery. But we find in the book of Jeremiah a prophecy that still hasn't been fulfilled that is a contradictory passage to what the Valley of Kidron is today. Jeremiah 31 verse 40 says, The whole valley of the dead bodies and the ashes and all the fields as far as the brook Kedron to the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be sacred to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or overthrown anymore forever. Do you know what that's saying? It's saying that the renovation of Kedron is going to relate this valley to a place that is made holy unto God and set apart for his use forever. No longer will it be associated with death and sorrow, but now with holiness and God's glory. This prophecy is still going to be fulfilled when Jesus returns and he establishes the new Jerusalem on a new earth. You see, God is able to make an area like the Kidron Valley a cemetery that is associated with mourning, sorrow, and death. He's able to take that and turn it around to make it eternally alive with his glory and honor. That is the hope that is coming still for the Kidron Valley, and Jesus can bring that same hope to your valley as well. But what about the healing? That we so long for. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us about this healing. It says of Jesus, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And listen to this, and with his wounds, we are healed. We are healed through the wounds of Jesus on our behalf. These verses tell us that Jesus understands every valley that we will go through in this life because he walked through the ultimate valley of suffering for you and it led to his death. He was despised, rejected, and shamed. He carried the grief and sorrows of everyone in the world on himself. He was willingly pierced in his side. A crown of thorns was crushed on his head 
for your sin and mine. He took all of our chastisement on himself to bring you peace. It is by his wounds that you are healed. Thank you, Jesus. If you are here today and you've not received his gift of salvation, don't wait any longer. The darkest valley that you are living in is the valley of sin. And Jesus is the only one who can rescue you and save you. So I urge you, repent, turn from your sin, confess him as Lord and Savior, believe on his death and resurrection for you. And if you're here today and you've been following Jesus for a short time or a long time, I know that it can be easy to get our minds focused in the wrong place when we are in a valley, specifically a valley of suffering. Recently in my own life, and actually believe in preparation for this message, God had me go through a valley of rejection. And it hasn't been the first time. But while I was in that valley, I found myself weeping and frustrated with God. And I questioned him, why are you allowing me to go through this again? And he brought me to Philippians 3, verses 7 through 11. These verses say, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And when I read those verses in the middle of that valley of rejection, I realized that God was allowing me to experience a small taste of what Jesus went through for me. He was rejected by his friends, his family, even the church of his day. And I had to ask myself the question, am I willing to share in his sufferings? And I ask you the same, follower of Jesus, are you willing to share in his sufferings? Because that's where the rubber meets the road in our walk with Jesus. We claim that we are his followers, But then too often when the valleys of life come, we get angry, we get frustrated, and we question him, and we want to give up instead of taking up our cross daily and following him to the very end. If you truly want to know your Savior, Don't resist the valleys he takes you through because they will only help you to know him more. But you have to keep your eyes glued on him. Valleys in life are not always a fun place to be. We can be honest about it. I don't always like the valleys in life. And the valley of death and grief that I live through in 2006 was not enjoyable. But I was reminded that I could have hope 
even in the valley of death because both of my grandpas knew and claimed Jesus as their savior. And I know that they have been made whole and they are in eternity with Jesus. If you haven't done so yet, I want you to grab your piece of paper and name your valley. Write it down. And you may wonder, Precious, why do you want me to name my valley? It's because naming it is the start for the healing process. When you name it, you identify it and acknowledge its existence. David named his valleys, so did Jesus. And I had to think about it myself. There are short valleys and long valleys in your life, and sometimes you're going through multiple valleys at once. I lived through that short valley of rejection a few weeks ago, but I had a conversation with Jonathan What valley do I feel like I'm currently living in? Because I can't ask you to do it if I'm not doing it myself. And for me, it's a valley I've been in for a little while. A valley that I call the valley of confusion. That may mean nothing to you, but it means something to me. I know exactly what it means. So does Jesus. I'm not alone in this valley of confusion. Right the name of your valley down on your piece of paper right now. And let me challenge you, if you can't name your valley, you won't be able to name what Jesus did for you. Jesus walked through the valley of death for you. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. It is in the valley of suffering that we see and experience more of who Jesus is and what he did for us. And as we sing our closing song today, remembering that Jesus is our living hope, I want you to take your valley that you wrote down on this piece of paper, and during the closing song, I want you to Bring it up to the front whenever you feel led. There's pins up here in these two bowls. I want you to take out a pin and pin it to the cross as a reminder that you never walk through the valley alone. As a follower of Jesus and with him by your side, you can always know that life will come out of your valley, whether that's here on earth or in heaven for eternity. That is why my heart will always be for the valley. Let me leave you with this encouragement. Jesus leads us through no darker valley than he has gone through himself. Jesus leads us through no darker valley than he has gone through himself. If you have your hand out with you, that sentence is on the bottom of it, but there's a blank there. I want you to take out your bulletin notes, and where that blank is, I want you to personalize it and write your name on that line. It would say, for me, Jesus leads precious through no darker valley than he has gone through himself. Therefore, Jesus can sympathize with you more and understand more of what you're going through than anybody else can. You never go through the valley alone. Will you stand and pray with me? Jesus, thank you that you went through the darkest valley of death to bring us life. God, if there is someone here today who has never received you as their savior, never been rescued from their valley of sin, I pray that they would call out to you right now, Lord Jesus, save me. I can't save myself. I believe in your death 
and resurrection for me. I confess that you alone can save. Forgive me and make me your child. Lord, thank you that you brought hope and healing to this dark, well, you're going to bring hope and healing to this dark, gloomy Kidron Valley, and you bring that same hope and healing to our valleys. God, thank you too that you help us to name our valleys. And for each person here, as they pin the name of their valley to the cross, would you let it serve as a reminder for them that you are always with them. No matter how deep, no matter how dark the valley is, you have been there. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.